baseball is dead. Rest in peace. I'm sad. I'm sad what's today. What's the matter? I'm, I'm sad. Uh, <laughs> I saw Jay Hayes tweet yesterday, which felt a little premature. Um, for those who didn't see the tweet, I'm happy to read it for you. Um, Monday's baseball is dead podcast. Dallas, my team is still moving and we still stink. Joey, my ace needs Tommy John. Justin, my ace needs Tommy John. Jared, did you see Jaron Duran capture the Clark's Ketchup Series MVP? Listen, he did do that. He did do that. And uh, the Red Sox won another series. We're recording Section 10 later tonight. Um, but the reason why we're recording Section 10 tonight and not last night is because last night was WrestleMania. And if you know me, you know that Roman Reigns is my favorite. He's been my favorite since the beginning, since he, he debuted more than 10 years ago. Uh, with he's the not Shield. the champ anymore, is he? And he's been the undisputed universal world heavyweight champion for 1,316 days. And uh, he he lost last night to Cody Rhodes, who cheated. Uh, John Cena came out and interfered. The Undertaker interfered. Like He straight up cheated um, to do that. And I had somebody tweet me last night, and can, they were like, can you put this in baseball terms for me? And I said... This is the 2001 World Series. It's back to back to back World Series champs losing in game seven with the best closer of all time on the mound, going for four straight titles and losing to a team that was not as good. That's what last night was. It was devastating. It was devastating. And I feel awful. I feel like it's such a bad loss that I I feel physically sick today because of it. Things are changing that the Diamondbacks cheated in 2001. There may have been people that were on performance enhancing drugs on that team. Yeah. This is probably not the point of where you're going with all this, but Mm -hmm. as an aside on the 2001 World Series, I remember it a little bit differently. Mm. I I know the Yankees were the better team during the regular season. That's what I meant. They had a better record. Okay. Because in that World Series, it felt like all the D-backs were doing was giving them chances to win the World Series because Byung Hyun Kim just yeah. kept blowing yeah. games that the D-backs had wrapped up. Yeah. And it was like, oh shit, this is game seven and the D-backs may not win this World Series, actually. Yeah. I just meant based on regular season record. I okay. think the Yankees won 95 games, the D-backs won 92 games. Um, so the, the Yankees were the better team. Yeah, and obviously three the straight, three-time champs. Four. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like Roman Reigns has been champion for four fucking years. And he lost I mean, to Cody Rhodes, who's just not as good. He's just not. I mean, I think in a lot of ways that proved to be kind of the end of that era of Yankees baseball, kind of fittingly though, right? Maybe this yeah. is kind of the end. I know they made the World Series in 03, but a little they, bit of a different shape to that team, and they also lost again. They so, did lose again. Um, yep. yeah. So what's he do now? So he just Well, he has movies? leukemia, so he's probably going to go away for a little bit. Can't yeah, have a champ with cancer. That's just not gonna well, work. Well, it's it. in remission, but he'll be on. Uh, Wait, his guy, the real guy, or the character? I don't the know. The real what's guy, going. Joe. The real guy. He's had leukemia for. He's been living with leukemia for a long time, but he has. Uh, he's on medication that he'll be on for the rest of his life. It's basically like oral chemotherapy that he will be taking for the rest of his life. Jesus. But it, he's in remission. But I think he needs a fucking break. He's probably gonna take a break for a little while. Yeah, it's a fair and Cody. That's a fair assessment. Yeah. Yeah. So they're like, I need to take a break. Well, the only way you get a break is if you get your ass beat and do double, triple backflips through a table. Well, that's that's the wrestling business, brother. That's business. Everyone goes out on their back. All the greats, all the greats go out on their back. Also, uh, speaking of baseball and WrestleMania last night, um, Roman Reigns had a kendo stick beating the shit out of Cody Rhodes with it, and he did the uh, he did the Gary Sheffield. Bat waggle before you hit him with it. That's uh, that is now. that is easily one of the more transcendent things about baseball is the Gary Sheffield bat waggle specifically. Not people yeah. just you know imitating batting stances like the batting stance guy who's fucking awesome. It's hilarious. Yeah. Um, 
but just that one specifically. Like if you do that mm -hmm. anywhere, people know who that is. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty identifiable, but uh, all I want to say is, yeah, Dallas's baseball team may be getting uprooted and yeah, you guys may have had playoff aspirations and both of your aces are getting Tommy John. Um, but nobody has it worse than me right now. Nobody mm. has it worse than me. I don't see it. Roman Reigns lost the the championship last night, and I don't know what to do because that means he's probably going to go away for a little while. I feel like I'm going to lose a little bit of my identity for a little bit. Um, as the tribal chief of baseball, he was just the tribal chief, and uh, it's a uh, I'm I'm feeling lost today. I'm feeling lost heavily. Um, uh, but I did I did uh, I just came off of MLB Network. That's uh, I wasn't wearing this onesie at the time. I, I did a wardrobe change for baseball is dead. Um, but on that episode or not episode on that show is high heat. I was talking to Alana Rizzo, who mentioned Dallas Braden. She sends her thoughts to you, Dallas, as someone who has also suffered great loss recently. Again, not as much as I have, um, but mm. how have since our last time meeting on this this podcast, how have the. Uh, the words been flowing to you on the internet and elsewhere. Um, I mean, it's, it's everything that I would have expected. It's everything that I have already felt before, right? A lot of mixed bags of emotion. A lot of folks who are just trying to make peace with, which is, I think the best way that I can describe what folks are experiencing, what folks will continue to experience is just different ways that they come to terms with, what is going on and how they're going to process it. Um, so there's been a lot of folks, like, like I said last time, you shoot me a DM um, as I'm able to go through them and respond. I give my phone number. I talk to these people because I, I know what they're going through. I can, I can feel it. And so I just want to give them an outlet, right? Like I don't want them feeling like they're just screaming into the void or they don't, they're not able to connect with somebody who doesn't understand what they're I do. I get it. So, um, I, I think it has been, it's been healthy for me. I can tell you that it's been healthy for me. And so I want to believe that it's serving the same purpose for some other folks, but, uh, but yeah, I think, you know, as still as, as fresh as everything is, people are right now just trying to figure out how they're going to process and handle, you know, maybe one, one last year of the Coliseum. And what that what that means to them. So I think people are are kind of coming to terms with that. Yeah, I wish I wish that we knew that it was going to be our last time at the Coliseum when we were beating your ass. I didn't I didn't have the chance to like take that in as oh this is the Red Sox last time getting to beat that ass at the Coliseum. Now we have to do it at a minor league ballpark for the next three fucking years. Oh, uh, buddy, so we'll be in town and we'll be in town in July. You know, we'll be in town in July. So don't don't worry about that. If you if you're worried about that ass whipping, it's coming. We'll be there in July, like I said. But if you're worried about just at the Coliseum, but if there's a lot of history, a lot of rich history in that ballpark in Sacramento, I know that I know, doesn't I was do part much of for it. you. That was part of it. Yeah. My my 30th birthday history um, at the Coliseum. Um, the Shamanaya no-hitter was mm -hmm. on the field for that. I basically <laughs> threw it myself. I was on the field after that happened. The the bubblegum shower. I have a piece of... Uh, of uh, bubble gum from the bubble gum shower that Sean and I had after the no hitter was thrown. So do I actually. There you go. Look at that. That's lovely. History. That is lovely. History. Mm -hmm. That is nice. History at the Coliseum. A couple little keepsakes. Um, yeah. Uh, Joseph, I know I said Tommy John. I don't want to get out in front of that one. Like we don't know just yet, but it is significant. You're sp damage. spreading nasty rumors right now saying well, I'm lashing out. Word. I'm lashing out. Here's something that I've kind of evolved into in my older age that Dallas should appreciate is uh, I've become more self-aware. <laughs> I I can acknowledge when I'm lashing out. And I think now is one of those times where I'm doing that. Um, the, the Spencer Strider news has not been the hammer hasn't been dropped. It doesn't look great. Anytime that you see significant damage to the UCL and getting second opinions. I think we know where that is headed, but as of right now, officially Spencer Strider is not headed for surgery as far as we know. So where, where are you at mentally, Joseph, on the news that uh, the Atlanta Braves ace Spencer Strider, which by the way, 
not to pile on Dallas. But, Thanks. We, uh, we were going to blow. We were so close to, to blowing pile on right Dallas. past that. All right. We don't Woo! even need to bring it up now. Now I know <laughs> that it's not me. So <laughs> he picked Alec Manoa for Cy Young last year. And so, so did, did I. You? And I was like, man, yeah. like, is that like a combined thing? No, it's just Dallas. Uh, he picked Spencer Strider for so I'm surprised he didn't pick Shane Bieber as well. That would have been undeniably damning, <laughs> but still picking Spencer Strider, who immediately has uh, this injury. Who not good. And the effects of Dallas picking Alec Manoa last year is still ongoing. Like, I don't know if you saw his line the other day in the in triple A, but man, that is a no, let's just say it wasn't good. I think it was there, like four walks, like fucking hit a guy. Yeah, well, look, there could good. be some there could be some other things at play that I think we're going to get into in a little while. So we don't need to, you know, I don't think we need to pile on me right now. If I'm being no. just, that's <laughs> I don't my think opinion. we need to pile on me right now. <laughs> <laughs> just my personal oh, perspective. Oh man, yeah. Uh, but anyways, sorry to cut you off, Joseph. Your thoughts on uh, the state of your Atlanta Braves and the Spencer Strider news? I don't know. They just said they put him on the 15 day IL yesterday. So that's what I'm. I'm expecting him to be back in 14 days. Wow. He's on the IL 15 days, a couple starts. What is that? Mm-hmm. Three starts. Come back, get some rest. Mm-hmm. He'll be back. Yeah, I don't think so. I don't think Why do got... you not think so? Well, I, I think you believe the down... media reports. Sometimes, you know, not always. You can't always believe what you read in the news, as we know. But I think in this particular case, from what we do know, because we don't have the whole, we don't have every piece of the puzzle here, but we do have some pieces. And uh, <clears throat> maybe we can kick it to the expert, my arm hurts guy on the podcast, <laughs> Dallas Braden. Um, yeah, what- I wouldn't know. I actually have my arm never hurts. It's actually strong. <laughs> I don't have a weak arm. So I'm yeah. not an expert in this. You're right. That's true. Let's kick it to a guy with a weak arm. Yeah. Dallas Braden, one of the weakest arms that we've ever experienced <laughs> in this game. Uh, what What do you think is the, the future of Spencer Strider here as someone who, oh, my arm, my wheel arm hurts all the time. <laughs> what do you think? <clears throat> Doesn't look good. Doesn't no. look good. I don't think that's a, a rocket science <clears throat> answer. I think we all have landed on that. Uh, I think we all are afraid for obvious reasons. We just don't want to see this. Um, I had a opportunity yesterday to speak with AJ Hinch uh, before the game, listening to him talk about and you know just the discourse surrounding what we're experiencing. And it sucks because you see these talented dudes. You just want to see. You want to see them. You want to see him perform. It's like going to a horse track and seeing all of the fucking thoroughbreds lined up, ready to roll. And then it's like, okay, well, actually, just behind them, you can watch the you can watch the little piggy races, you know, like they have at the county fair, because that's that's ultimately what it feels like you're getting. You're geared up to have all of these thoroughbreds start start this race, run this race, but then that's not what you're getting. You're, you're getting, you know, like a 10 year old broken down mule like myself trying to <laughs> trying to run that race. And that's not what that's not what our game deserves. That's not what these guys deserve. And that's why I think we get into such a, a long, lengthy, nuanced conversation about what is going on with the rash of injuries in the major leagues. How does it get prevented? How did we get here? Um, and, and that's. Man, it has been a, uh, I got to tell you, like the last, the last week I have spent a lot of time on the phone, a lot of time messaging people back and forth, you know, cause I want, I want to learn and I'm, you know, I'm talking to doctors, I'm talking to scientists, I'm talking to biomechanists. Um, and it's just, it's, it's alarming that we are at the point we were, we are at with the lack of answers that we have. It's it's alarming. It really is. Um, it's just. What do you say? What do you say, Joe? It's just speculation at this point. You're right. We have no answers. So no. I don't like to act like Spencer Strider's hurt. Why don't we just act like he's fine? Well, he's definitely hurt. Well, it's just a matter well, of how he's hurt. a little hurt. He's a little hurt, but 15 <laughs> days. That's it. <laughs> and it's no, April. That, that's a procedural move. Like the, they said there was damage to the UCL and Brian Snicker said the results of the MRI were quote, not good. Not great. And remember, <laughs> like I, I, as interesting as, as what Dallas Maybe is talking about. Maybe that's what he about, meant. They're not is, good. They're great. 
<laughs> they cut him off. It was sele- it was a selective <laughs> quote. Um, no, it, for for as interesting as what Dallas is talking about to me, like, and that's been like the dominant conversation coming off the Bieber Strider news. I think almost lost in that. I feel like is the impact on the Atlanta Braves twenty twenty four title hopes. Like I, I I feel like I haven't seen anybody discuss that, and maybe people are waiting to dive into that until to Joey's point, we see the exact nature of the absence, but there are tea leaves here and they can be read. And it sounds like a very serious situation for Strider, even if it doesn't result, even if my, you're right. Even if my tweet was getting ahead of itself, when I said he needs Tommy John, it was more tongue. It was more like obviously sent with a certain tone, but like he has damage to his UCL and that's not the sort of thing that's going to result in uh, we're back in three weeks. No. We're back in a month. No. It's more likely no. that he misses the rest of the season than it is that he's Jay, back in two weeks and half of the, next season. This is this is where they need to be at the exact same place. I talked about the Texas Rangers with Jacob DeGrom. The sooner the Atlanta Braves can make peace with the fact that Spencer Strider will not be impacting their 2024 run in the early part of 2025, the better off they will be. The sooner that they understand that and figure out how to operate around that, the better off they will be. And it's cold and it feels callous, but this is a win right now business, period. And you can't help win right now. So we need to move on from you and the role you will serve with us right now. And we need to find some way to supplement that, whether that's internally or whether that's hitting the market. That's those. I mean, what else would you do? You going to sit there and cry about it? No, 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 no. You're right. I mean, they're obviously still in win now mode, but the term win now is its own loaded term here because like he is their difference maker in the rotation. And For I know sure. his specific postseason. I know his postseason track record has been a little spotty so far, but I put basically no stock in that because it's just like an, it's just such a small sample and he's such a young pitcher like this team is def- this team and this rotation are definitely good enough to cruise to the NL East title with or without Spencer Strider. But the goal for the Braves is the is to make and or win the World Series. And to me, like this this isn't quite on the level of the Garrett Cole news because the Braves have much better overall 24 man roster depth, depth or 26 man roster depth. Um and have more depth, I think, in the rotation, Sand Strider. But in terms of like playoff impact, I mean, it's it's right up there. It's much more interesting to me than the Bieber news because, yeah, that 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 kind of wipes out the Guardians. But the Guardians were by basically any measure like a one in three, one in four shot to make the postseason well, this season. And, and the Braves were the consensus favorite or co favorite in baseball to make the World Series and. Strider was the fa- the betting favorite to win the NL Cy Young. Like it's just well, like and the intrigue. Yeah, okay, elbow injuries in baseball, but like, how about the Braves right now? And 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 the intrigue around Bieber was also like like I brought up like, yo, I mean, do we start talking about moving this dude early, like before May flowers? You know what I'm saying? Like, is that, is that what we were talking about? Is that what his performance was starting to do? Yeah, it was starting to bring up the direction of the guards. Is the central going to be something that they're going to be competitive or trying to get after? Or do we say goodbye to Bieber to reload or try? I mean, I, th- I think they're still going to be competitive without Bieber. I just don't think that they have like this caps their ceiling dramatically in mm-hmm. terms of, you know, short season or, or short series viability if they were to advance in the postseason, et cetera, et cetera, like. You know, obviously, probably changes priorities a little bit, and, and it sucks is, for the Braves because it's like if you're gonna, if you're, you know, you lose Strider and you want to pick up a new guy at the deadline, a new pitcher, you can't because they're probably all going to get Tommy John too at this point. Well, like, well, how's who's getting? Well, who's well, Joe, still going to have an arm by the All Star break? Well, Joe, seriously though, think about like this is where they you got to feel inventory. You, you got to feel like all of the moves made. And all of the signings and the depth of your roster, the way it looks right now, that's part of why you try to get things done in that fashion, right? If you're if you're Anthopolis, if you're the front office, isn't this why you do this? Is so that if you find yourself you Chris Sale. if you find yourself up shit creek with only four paddles, 
when you need five to row your boat, you feel like, well, you know what? Hey, I can go, f- I can go find that other paddle. We can go pay for that other paddle. We're good. And we might have resources that we're willing to walk away from to secure that fifth paddle to bring us back into that realm of when we get to the World Series, not if this is why, because we have the depth sort of position. Yeah. Now we're relying on Chris Sale, which, you know, he's an injury risk too. And Chris Sales look great. Charlie Morton, relying on him, he's 40. So it's kind of concerning. But I think you could say that for most teams. I think if you look, compare the Braves pitching to other teams around the league, we're probably, you know, top five still without Strider. Kind of guessing there, but it sounds bright. Um, it just sucks if you look at the Braves. I don't know what's going to happen with Strider. I think he'll be back in two weeks if he's not. And it is Tommy John and he's never the same. It's like, you know, it's just crazy how often this happens. If you just look at the Braves star pitchers, not star pitchers, but like young pitchers like Soroka, where's he? You know, injured, never been the same. Doesn't look like he's going to be the same. Ian Anderson was lights out, postseason hero. Mm-hmm. Same thing, injured in the minor leagues. Even Yaskar Yanoa had a moment. Same thing. Oh, self-inflicted though. Yeah, he punched a wall, but punched I think <laughs> he did punch a wall yeah. as hard as he can. But guess what? The umpire made some bad calls. So I'm going to actually blame the umpire on that one. Okay, um, fair. fair. And I believe he actually got Tommy John after he punched the wall. So okay. it was it was a double entendre. All right. <laughs> but it's crazy how often this happens and how many young pitchers the Braves have had and come up first season, lights out, and then it's like injury. And now they're not there. And we just like, we keep getting these new guys. And as soon as we think this is the fucking guy for the rest of forever, they get injured. All right. All right. Well then, I mean, is this, I, you know, I was kind of holding off. I didn't want to get into that conversation. Is it, do you, is it time to get into that conversation? Because this was a quote from Dr. James Andrews. Ever heard of him? Uh, he and this fellow by the name of Thomas John got together when his elbow hurt. And they they strapped a ligament together, and they called the surgery Tommy John. So that's who that's who Doctor James Andrews is. Okay, um, and this is his quote: "I started following the injury patterns and injury rates in the year 2000." Andrews said, "Back in those days, I did about eight or nine Tommy Johns per year in high school aged and younger. The large majority of Tommy Johns were at the major league level, then the minor league level, and then the college level." and then just a handful of high school kids. In today's situation, the whole thing is flip-flopped. The largest number is youth baseball. They've surpassed what's being done in the major leagues. That's a terrible situation. Andrew says the obsession with velocity and spin at the youth level is having a devastating impact on arms and the game itself. These kids are throwing 90 miles an hour their junior year of high school, he says. The ligament itself Please pay attention to this. Please, please pay attention to this. The ligament itself can't withstand that kind of force. We've learned in our research lab that baseball is a developmental sport. The Tommy John ligament matures at about age 26. In high school, the red line where the forces go beyond the tensile properties of the ligament is about 80 miles an hour. End quote. So just to taste myself there for a little bit, you heard it from a dude who went to school like for a lot of years, spent a lot of money to get the degrees so we could open up these elbows and do what he's doing. And with just my stupid brain being a dumb rock thrower, I'm able to understand where the fuck we're at. Just like this guy who read all the books, just like this guy who's done all the surgeries. And it's, it's kind of clear that we have hit that point evolutionarily where we don't or can't withstand what we are now able to do physically. Those are the facts. So where do we go from there? And this is where the conversation starts to really open up and you can travel down so many different paths because you could talk about the health of the art itself. And if you are a steward of the game, if you are a keeper of the game, you, you should be trying to preach and teach the fundamentals of this game. And those grow and get passed on as we matriculate through the game itself. And when we get to advanced levels, we start to have advanced conversations about things like spin, 
about the importance of velocity. Well, the, the thing is, we have all this information right now. So if you're eight and you have a Wi-Fi connection, you can start to look at how guys are throwing harder, why they're doing it, what it's tied to. It's tied to compensation, right? Before you get to compensation, you could also tie it to education because how do you get a scholarship if you're trying to go play baseball and you're a pitcher? You better be punching tickets. How do you punch tickets? You throw hard. So it's directly tied to compensation at the very base level. Kids get picked and choose to go play for X travel team because they throw hard and they're going to be showcased. And why wouldn't I do that every opportunity I have? The more I get seen, the more my name's out there, the closer I am to that college scholarship that I've been hunting. Because we all know what happens after I go to college. I naturally get drafted, right? Isn't that how this goes? So this is where the brains of the youth and their parents are at right now. How do we change that? How do you change that? And that's why this conversation, you almost feel like you hit a wall the the minute you start asking these questions because now we start to get into, think about from the major league perspective, all right? Employees and the, the rate at which you can turn over without having to pay X amount. So if it's almost like having interns, it's almost like having interns because you can get these folks to come up and bust their ass, grind, grind, grind for three years before they hit ARB. And if they blow out in three years, guess what you didn't have to do? You didn't have to pay them. And guess what's coming next? Another crop of guys who are coming and graduating from the velocity farms of youth baseball and so on ready to rip that fucking heater, ready to rip that slide piece, ready to rip that sweeper as many times as you need them to until what? Until I either keep keep healthy or I pop. One of the two. One of the two. And how do you change that at the major league level? Because it's obvious that spin and velocity wins. It's It's obvious that those things are king. And that's where the compensation goes. So it's almost like the game is in a spot where it has worked itself in a position that you don't have to pay the guys who are achieving exactly what you want. And it's going to take a while before you get there because the Striders and the Coles, those guys are going to get breaded up, period, right? But the number of those guys will start to go down even more, I think, until we're at a point where you just are able to run through pitching the way we are because that's just the norm. That, that, that's just what happens. And I would hate for us to get there. So it's basically like uh, we started paying guys for like uh, there was a point in baseball. Where it's like, oh, man, like this this guy hits 350. Like that's that's the mark of greatness offensively. And then it was like, well, now we're going to start paying guys for doubles and homers instead of like batting average. And then we saw the epidemic of uh, steroids in baseball. You can just easily police steroids or performance enhancing drugs. It's not a perfect science, but you can definitely get it out of the game for uh, a, a vast majority. But now when we start looking at the pitching side of it, the, I guess, epidemic is velocity. And it's like, all right, now there's all these velocity farms. You can learn velocity. You can work towards increasing your velocity and then the result of that is now all of these surgeries on shoulders and elbows and there's nothing you can do like you can get steroids out of the game but what are you going to do about guys that are going out there being like you know i throw 94 but i'm trying to throw 97 98 and once you start doing that guess what now you got tommy john surgery well and and Dallas, you know, alluded to this too, but it's not just throwing harder and it's not just 97, it's 97 with like the maximum amount of spin possible too, yeah. right? And the idea that that isn't taxing on the elbow or the shoulder or different parts of the body, depending on the different individual is crazy. I mean, it obviously is go out and try and do it uh, and see how it feels a little different uh, if you haven't, well, don't actually try, but like you, if you did. Uh, I think you'd notice that it it felt a little different, but like Dallas, like, listen, I, I, it's all speculation to a degree. I think most people, the consensus seems to be that 
it's it's about exactly what you were talking about and what Jared is talking about with throwing harder and increasing spin and the idea that so so that brought up two things that I wanted to bring to to say which was you you brought up Spencer Strider and the Garrett Coles and the Spencer Striders are always going to get paid but Spencer Strider's contract is w- Joey correct me if I'm wrong 80 million dollars or something like that it was like 7 years 80 million dollars wasn't it and it was the for a guy who had a claim at best pitcher in the game or one of the or the most promising ascending young pitcher in the game like Garrett Cole got 320 million dollars because he was able to make it to free agency and cash in at the absolute peak of his value Spencer Strider whether whether consciously uh subconsciously whether through the influence of his agent family whatever like maybe he knew that there was a timeline to what he was doing because of the things that he's been asked to do or pressured into doing or feeling like he's compelled to do in that throw hard throw spin stuff and that's why he took a deal for 80 million or whatever maybe i'm off by a little bit no you're 80. right six six okay. years 75 mil okay so he took a deal for 75 million dollars instead of hey i'm gonna pitch three more seasons and i'm gonna get the fucking garrett cole deal because i'm confident that i'm still going to be healthy there's got to be something to that so jay that is exactly what i'm talking about instead of getting to the point where they got to pay him garrett cole money He's yeah. landed in a place physically where he might understand that that window before I pop is closing every day because of what I'm doing. And the team recognizes that and says, well, we can capitalize on what he, what he's going to be able to do right now. And this is the price tag we're willing to pay for it right now. This is what it means to us right now. No problem. Here's the check because we don't want to be in a position where we're paying this dude that Garrett Cole kind of money and not getting that Garrett Cole return just yet we don't want to get there so how do we prevent that we get him in a place where we find that that happy medium between where he's at health wise and what we need to pay him for what he's done what he could do wise and they landed on it and, to the tune of six for 75 and there's o- and there's almost no doubt in my mind that the braves are confident in the idea that even if spencer strider was to miss a full season due to injury that they could still get their $75 million worth over the life of that contract mm-hmm. and maybe much, much more. The other thing that you that struck me as interesting about this whole s- situation was that the MLBPA and Tony Clark came out with a very pointed statement as it relates to the pitch clock. And I know that got a, like, got like a lot of ancillary like attention for this is why injuries are up. To me, that almost felt... Uh, ca- not even almost, it felt counterproductive to me to issue that statement uh, and make it about the pitch clock. You might have grievances as it relates to the implementation of the pitch clock and then the change after one season of the pitch clock to make it even faster. But like most of the people seem to be of the opinion that it is a much more like, uh, like involved and like deep rooted situation than the pitch clock, which well, might be a very small factor in the overall it, situation. It, the, the pitch clock, which you, what do you got, Jared? Um, where does the sticky stuff fall into this? Because oh, Tyler huge, Glasgow huge. Spoke yes, about I, was, this. I was. Yeah, okay. I was just going to bring play, that up. This, this is two years ago. Yep. Tyler Glass now talking about feeling the sticky the stuff. Yes, and how your body feels. But I a hundred percent believe that contributed to me getting hurt. Uh, no doubt, without a doubt. Um, I think like it's it's ridiculous. I'm just gonna. I have used sticky stuff before. It's ridiculous that like it seems like this whole public perception of like, oh, it's just like select few people. Like your favorite pitcher probably 50 years ago was using something too. Like if you felt these balls, how inconsistent they were. Like you have to use something. So in the past, I my like substance of choice is sunscreen and rosin, like just nothing agree, just something to where I can get a grip on the ball. So it doesn't feel dusty, but two starts ago against the nationals, I went cold Turkey, nothing. And before that start, I remember when all this stuff came out, I was talking to people and talking to doctors and they were like, the thing that maybe MLB doesn't realize or that players don't realize is like, what, what is the injury? Like what, what is the prevention of like, maybe it'll add to injuries. And in my mind, I was like, that sounds dumb. That sounds like an excuse a player would use to make sure he can use sticky stuff. But I threw to the nationals with nothing. I've never been, I don't use sticky stuff to, I don't use spider tack. I don't need more spin. I I have huge hands. I spin the ball fine. I want grip. I did well against the nationals, probably one of the best starts I had all year. 
I woke up the next day and was like, I am sore in places that I didn't even know I had muscles in. Like I felt completely different. I switched my fastball grip and my curveball grip. I've thrown it the same way for however many years I've played baseball. I had to change. I had to put my fastball deeper into my hand and grip it way harder. And I had to, instead of holding my curveball at the tip of my fingers, I had to dig it deeper into my hand. So I'm like choking the shit out of all my pitches. My cue I used to use with Snyder was hold the ball like an egg, like nice and loose, be loose. That's out of the window. So I, I now have to develop a new cue. I have to develop something where I can't hold the ball light anymore. I have to dig it deep into my hand. So I'm taking it and you have to think, I'm not a doctor. I know you guys probably know that, but I'm taking a, a fastball. I'm squeezing the ball twice as hard. So all of this is I'm recruiting all these muscles and I'm taking my arm as hard as I can. throwing. So I mean, you get the gist of it from Glasnow where, you know, when they're trying to crack down, like there's all this stuff about trying to blame the pitch clock. And it goes without saying, like people want just one concrete answer. Why is this happening? There's and a lot. They they expect this uniformed answer where it's like it's the pitch clock's fault, it's the velocity's fault. But I think when you when you look at the crackdown on sticky stuff, that's a contributor. Like These there are, are contributors to this. All of them. It's not just one thing. Like I think when you look at the pitch clock, does that contribute to fatigue? Yeah. Yeah, attributes to to well, fatigue a little bit, but the high velocities and now without the same sticky stuff, so guys don't have the same grip, and now you're the ball is like further into guys' hands, and they're 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 choking the pitches like they didn't before, and now like Glasnow is pointing to his elbow and his forearm. It's like now like like when I'm like holding pitches before and I don't have as much of a firm grip on the baseball. Well, now, like when I have to like really grip it, I'm activating all these muscles in here that were not getting activated before. So th there, I, I think it's multi-layered and I, and, and people want this one uniformed answer as to why is this happening? And I think that there are multiple culprits for why this is happening. We, well, th this is what happens when you start to dabble in one area of the game and focus in one area of the game from so many, um, there are so many microscopes that pitching is under, right? <clears throat> but think about, just <laughs> think about this. What was spider tack for? Who was spider tack for? It was for, and it is for power lifters, power lifters. Okay. So just power and they use it so that they can get a grip essentially doing limited max effort movements limited they're not lifting the ball 105 times they're picking that huge fucking atlas ball up and they're carrying it to a to a podium to a, and they're they're setting it down and then they they might do that 5 times so they're they're using this stuff a weightlifter is using this max grip substance to achieve like max power in a limited amount of reps. And now here we are taking this same stuff and using it to try to achieve max spin, max velo, but we're doing that a hundred times. Well, we, we can, you, you can start to understand like what well that's what's happening so there's so many different so many different angles the pitch clock jared you exercise jay hey you've never been weaker smaller or slower and i appreciate that honesty what do you do when you max out you you do do you do do you do 12 reps jared no i sure don't no no. Why, why, why do you not do 12 reps? And then on top of not doing those 12 reps, how come you don't do those 12 reps timed? Like, how come you don't do those 12 reps in 15 seconds? Would that be really hard for you to do? Sure would be. Yeah. Well, then what if I asked you to just like repeat that every four minutes or five minutes or so? Would, would that I mean, be taxing would, on you quickly? Yeah, you would you would break down over time. Yeah, you would get weaker. Okay, so you're saying you could probably use a little more time to recover 
if I'm asking you to do something at a max effort. Is that what you're getting at? Correct. Okay. So now we're talking about the pitch clock and there's an understanding that the body has to recover. And when guys are out there generating the kind of force that they are, because remember, I told you, and then Dr. Andrews told you, but your boy DB told you first that we are moving more efficiently than we ever have, which is creating more torque and velocity than we've ever been able to, but we are not at a point where we can withstand it. So on top of doing that, we are now being forced into a window of time to do that, where the body quite literally cannot recover. So yeah, it's just another aspect of what's going on. You're asking these guys to throw as hard as they possibly can in a smaller window of time and to do it repeatedly over and over and over again. And why are you asking them to do that? Because swing and miss is king, power at the dish is king. Those are the two things that get compensated in this game. Those are the two things that get you to each next level in this game. And until that stops getting rewarded, which I can't see how it would ever happen, we won't find an answer. <sighs> it sucks because there's no end in sight for this stuff. Like it's it's going to continue to happen. You just kind of have to. I don't even want to say weather the storm because it's not even that. Like there's no weathering the storm. I feel like it's not a storm. This is the reality. Storm, yeah, like weathering the storm would be kind of like what the Yankees are doing with Garrett Cole, where they kind of had a scare like MRI and this doesn't look good. And it's like, all right, best case, uh, you know, we're going to we're going to be sans Garrett Cole for a couple of months here. And that's weathering the storm. Like you're still going to get Garrett Cole. He's still going to make, uh, you know, hopefully 20 ish starts in the the 15 to 20 start range, something like that. That would be great. Um, but the Guardians can't say that about Shane Bieber. We know he's clipped. And correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't Spencer Strider already get clipped when he was at Clemson? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So this is this is number two for him. Mm -hmm. So no. you just you just don't know what this shit. Um, it's a it's a shitty part of our game, and you know when you start to look at the rest of the league, and I mean no one's gonna get seven hundred million dollars again. Maybe, maybe somewhere down the line, like, you know, with inflation. But as far as the skill set that Shohei Otani has, we're not going to see that. But you have a guy like Yoshinobu Yamamoto come to the United States and get $326 million before he ever throws a pitch. Like the investment that some of these teams are making in premier pitching, it is such a huge risk given where the evolution of pitching is going it's like the risk is never the the salaries have never been higher and the risk has never been higher to make these commitments to these players and the sh <clears throat> and the shift in landscape is what will have to come about it's going to have to be teams becoming an outlier early and saying we will we're going to go a seven-man rotation because everybody that comes into our organization is going to just be throwing baseballs differently. We're going to do it differently. And it's tough to deviate from what you know, because there's so much parody in professional sports. Why? Because if you see somebody's secret sauce work, well, why would you not put that in your recipe? Why would you not try to cook the same way they're cooking, right? Because they're cooking championships and that's what you want to be cooking. So it's tough to deviate from what the industry tells you is the norm or the industry tells you is the direction you should go. This is how it's done. This is how it's always been done. And there's been, you know, slight changes to that. Not wholesale, not wholesale changes like lengthening the rotation, right? We've gone from four to five and that was like, oh God, I can't believe it. You need an extra starter to get through. And well, that's just the norm of our industry now, right? So when does that change happen? You know, we talk about, the idea of the ligament not being able to withstand anything over 80 miles an hour and not being fully mature until you're 26. How old Spencer Strider? 25. So Dr. Andrews feels like he's got another year really until the ligament that he's been stepping on for God knows how long is going to be fully mature and ready to handle whatever Spencer Strider is able to generate. And even then the question is, is can it handle what Spencer Strider is able to generate? 
And I think the answer to that is no, because it's obvious that it couldn't handle it before it was mature years ago. And we're still one year away from it being totally mature in the opinion of the doctor. So what are you asking these kids uh, to do? Not throw not throw 92 miles an hour when they were a junior in high school? Oh, you want me to throw 80? Because the kid across the street's throwing 95. And that kid just got 15 letters. That kid's going on his recruiting trips. But yeah, let me dial it down to 80. No problem. I'll see you in the 13th grade down the street at junior college. Which there's absolutely fucking nothing wrong with. But. Yeah. Um. You know, kind of just to to put a bow on this discussion, um, the na- the reason why we're having the discussion is obviously because of Spencer Strider and Shane Bieber. Uh, uh, we kind of touched on what the implications would be for the Atlanta Braves, but Jay, hey, what do you think about uh, the implications this will have on the Guardians knowing for sure? Like, I we can, I think we we we're knowing we we know kind of where it's headed for the Braves. Uh, but we don't know for sure if he's getting TJ, but we do know for for Shane Bieber. So uh, is Bybee enough to carry this rotation? I know Tristan McKenzie did not look good his first time out. He goes again today for his second start of the year. Um, is is Tristan McKenzie and a Tanner Bybee enough to uh, anchor the Guardians to the postseason given the start that they've gotten out to? Best run differential in baseball, I believe. Yeah, I mean, it's obviously a really encouraging start. Um, if you believe fan graphs, it hasn't done much for their playoff odds, uh, believe it or not. I would say that I think this team is still going to be very competitive in the AL Central this season. Um, but I think that this considerably diminishes their ability to win the division and certainly it all but eliminates any sort of you know, kind of miracle postseason run, I think, because um, I think, you know, they have other fine pitchers in this rotation. Um, They did not have another Shane Bieber at peak Shane Bieber levels, which is what we were seeing through two starts. If it had been if Shane Bieber had come out and looked like shit or looked like the diminished version uh, that he had in previous seasons where he was just kind of getting through starts and not missing a lot of bats. And then he went down for TJ. Maybe my opinion of where this could have gone would have been different, but I was extremely optimistic on Bieber entering the season. I talked about that on this pod. Uh, he was delivering on that optimism more than delivering on it uh, through two starts. And then to see him go down, I do think it's a significant, significant blow. And then he's a free agent after this season. So it's almost certainly the end of his Cleveland Guardians career, um, which stinks on a number of levels. It stinks that He's not going to be in the uniform anymore, uh, and it also stinks to the point that Dallas has brought up a couple of times that um, if they did decide that they're not viable options in the Central this season, that it, it also eliminates the ability to get a meaningful return for him. So a, a big lose all the way around. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's what sucks is um, there was already kind of this narrative around Biebs with the the velocity going down each year and is he going to be traded what's his trade value should we hang on to him do we extend him and now he will have to enter a free agency like like this uh, do you think that this, this is not a situation where he signs with a team next like teams are going to want to see him throw right like you're not just going to have him sign next winter like he's going to still be recovering halfway through next year I mean, yeah that- I, I would think this is a you know, a late in spring sort of contract or or just one that, you know, comes to an agreement way sooner than that. But it's for a dollar amount that factors in the idea that he's actively recovering from Tommy John yeah. surgery. So, um, yeah, because teams e- are doing way, that he's not, now. Like team, yeah. teams are paying pitchers yeah. to recover with them. Like, I mean, Br- Br- Brandon, Brandon Woodruff. Woodruff was always. Yeah, exactly. Was always going to miss the 2024 season. The Brewers <laughs> opted that they, they know his medical history better than anybody. Hey, maybe maybe the market is such for Shane Bieber that he comes back to the Guardians uh, on a one and one or something like that. I don't think that's going to happen, given the way that Cleveland probably needs to spend its resources moving forward. But the Red Sox um, just did that with Michael I guess Fulmer. You never know. Yep, the Red yep. Sox signed Michael Michael Fulmer to a two year deal. He's they knowing that he wasn't going to throw a single pitch this year. Braves did it with Matzik. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, maybe so we'll see. 
But I feel like in the case of Shane Bieber, his contract is going to, out of all the names mentioned here, his contract is going to be the most uh, interesting, you know, like uh, substantial. Um, So we'll keep an eye on the Spencer Strider situation, although that doesn't sound super great. But there's been no official update on that. There's rumors that he just wanted to get a second opinion because the doctor's in Texas and he's a fan of the moon and it's the best place to see the eclipse in America. So he's just going to Texas to see the moon. Yeah, could be. Which guess what? And I'm not going to confirm or deny that. It's where I'm at right now. Um, just a hard pivot right here. It's something that I brought up with you guys a few days ago, but Fangraphs Mm. has updated their wins above replacement formula. Um, they're replacing uh, UZR's range component with outs above average, pretty much. So it's it, it's basically it, you're looking at defense more accurately. Uh, there are better metrics to look at with defense. Uh, you know, we're 10 years ago, you would look at defensive metrics and be like, none of this shit makes sense. Like defensive metrics well, used to look at Mike Trout and be like, this guy sucks. You know, like I, it, we did not have an, it, it, it's still not an exact science. Like we still haven't figured out defensive metrics down to uh, the most accurate form that I'm sure it's going to take in coming years. But outs above average is better than UZR and UZR 150. Um, but I just, I just thought it was interesting, Dallas. I just found it to be, it stood out to me that. The, so the UZR, not UZR, the, the war update goes back to 2016. They're now updating and reconfiguring everyone's wins above replacement on fan graphs going back to 2016. And the player who had the largest difference in the negative direction, as in they lost war. Well, that player was Mookie Betts. Mookie Betts lost three wins above replacement under the new Fangraphs wins above replacement formula. Uh, Other big losers, Joey Gallo, Andrew Benintendi, Paul Goldschmidt, Gary Sanchez. Um, I think Judge was on that list somewhere, too. Uh, He was further down. He lost 1.2 war. One of my Um, questions about the defensive side of this is, did they are they factoring in the inability to shift? And that these guys have more of a calculable starting location. Uh, I I didn't read too much into it. You can read more about the stat. Blah 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 blah. Where is it? Um, the catcher blocking <laughs> component is something that's a complete list of what's included in the update. The catcher blocking component, uh, UZR's arm runs, uh, defensive runs, saves, stolen base, prevented runs above average has been replaced with the catcher throwing component. Ultimate base running and weighted grounded into double play runs have been replaced with stat cast base running metric. Um, and then UZR's double play runs has been removed. I don't see anything about the shift. Well, if they're using outs above average, then like the starting point for the fielder is yeah. Definitely being factored in because the way outs above average works is out probability based on where Starting the ball point. is hit and where that fielder was beginning. So I would have to assume that yes, I think is the answer to your question. Mm. That makes sense. I mean, it sounds like a move in the right direction is, I guess, my take. Like, I know a lot of people use any opportunity where war changes a number or or it's it's calculation to be like oh it's a made up stat whatever it's like okay it it is it is a stat that is a work in progress acknowledged as such that is trying to continue to become more and more accurate that to me seems like a laudable goal um and replacing what at the time was the best option for fielding assessment with what is now the best at least publicly available assessment for fielding seems like a good move for me. I think people, and, uh, go well, ahead. I was gonna say, I think people feel like it, it starts to go like, it starts to feel like cherry picking though. And when, when you're saying, all right, here's the stat that describes how great this guy is, but it's not, it's not totally right. 
and and we're saying we're still kind of working on it. It's like, all right, well then, well, okay. well then so what are you telling me? Uh, you know, I, like I I appreciate that we have something but, like that. But, I but that's fine. You, I could make I, I can make a similar argument about batting average, where if somebody's going to say batting average over time, that that is also an incomplete situation because of the different run environments over the course of Major League Baseball or OPS or something like that, where an OPS in the mid and late nineties is not the same as the OPS in the dead ball era. So like that, that particular argument against war holds basically no argument to me because to Jared's point about Mookie Betts losing three wins above replacement. Okay. That's the most you want to know where Mookie Betts still ranks from 2016 to 2024 overall major league baseball. Number one. So it, it didn't change who Mookie Betts is as a baseball player. It changed a fraction of what of how three of 50 viewed. wins above. Yeah, he had. So he had 53 before and he's got 50 now unless the leaderboard's still not updated. But uh, according to fan graphs, he still leads from 2016 to 2024 of all position players in Major League Baseball. And he lost. Six percent of his total, which isn't something that I, I'm not dismissing it. I think, as I said, I think the change is interesting. Yeah. But we're still talking about yeah, one I, of the all time great outfielders. Yeah. That we've had and, I, and, I'm, and I'm speaking like from, yes, I'm, and I'm speaking from when you're, when we as people who follow the game to the extent that we do, to the depth that we do, when we are trying to explain what war is, and I'm not talking about the actual formula of war, but just the layman explanation, right? Of, like I said, this is the stat that kind of tells you just overall how good this player is. And then when you also have to frame it as, but it's an incomplete stat and it, it's still kind of working. The response uh, the always for me, the initial response is, well, what do you, well, then what is it doing? What do you mean? If it's not right, then what? And, and that's like, that's, well, look, hold on, hold on. You know, and you got to go, you got to explain that to him. That's, that, that's fine. That's fine. The, there is no defensive component to batting average. It's literally not acknowledging that side of the game at all. So again, like I understand that that's, that is the issue that you encounter most often. And I also encounter that issue most often when I'm trying to explain or have a discussion with somebody about war mm -hmm. that is not like deep in the weeds in the sport or the stats or whatever. But to me, explaining it the way that we're talking it out right now should be a sufficient explanation yes. for why war changes over the course of time or gets tweaked. If a guy goes from the first best player or the fifth best player to the 25th best player now over a period a of time, I want an explanation about that. Yeah. That that to me requires, that to me says something is wrong here. W what is happening? That's not the case with this update. And to me, it's just moving forward on a, on a component of wins above replacement that we have all always acknowledged is particularly imperfect with an imperfect stat. And I, if, if people listening to this podcast, when I cite war, think that I'm not implicitly acknowledging that it is an imperfect stat to capture player value, I am absolutely acknowledging that. What it does, though, is it gives you one number to capture offense and defense and position and stuff like that in a way no singular offensive stat can allow you to. So should it be part of the picture? Yes, but like, I, I don't know. I just, uh, to me, to me, it's a good thing, I guess. Yeah, I, look, dude, as somebody who, as somebody who is not like overall, just is not a huge fan of like numbers in general. And it's always struck me why I love baseball the way I do, because it's so numbers oriented, so numbers based. You need you need it helps tell the story it, it like and I think you're ignorant or you're practicing really hard at being dumb if you just try to ignore the impact that numbers have and how they can help tell the story. You have to yet, you know, and, and so I've accepted that war is as imperfect as I feel it is, but I've also accepted that there's just no other way to let you know how great these guys are without without going that route, without using these analytics. So it's the easy, easiest stat to understand, but the most complicated shit ever. It's like whoever <laughs> has the most war is better. If they have a higher number, they're better. No matter what position, when they play, no matter whatever, it's just so easy. And then if you look into it, you're like, holy shit, it's a fucking I, complicated metric. Right. 
And you know what's funny about that? That's 100% true. Uh, I, I can't calculate war. You, I don't think anybody without the internal information can actually calculate wins above replacement. But like, <laughs> it's also funny because if you ask the typical baseball fan, like, hey, this guy's OPS is this entering the game, and he just went two for five with a double. What is his OPS now? You, and you give them an hour to do it. I bet most fans can't do that either. Mm -hmm. And nobody has a problem citing OPS over the course of time, right? It's just about making it, it making people used to a stat over time, uh, even if there is some underlying lack of awareness about how you get to that stat in yeah. time. And like, I no, know last year, like wins above replacement took a little bit of heat over the course of the season or was like held up for some criticism because it was like, well, what do you mean Ronald Acuna Jr. is not the best player in the NL by leaps and bounds? Like. Mookie Betts and Freddie Freeman shouldn't even be in the MVP conversation. By the end of last season, Ronald Acuna had nine wins above replacement and Freddie Freeman and Mookie Betts had seven, eight and seven, seven. So it arrived at the same conclusion that just about everybody else arrived at, which was that Ronald Acuna was the NL MVP and deserved to be. So like, I don't know. It's and, and more often than not, I think it's helpful I, as opposed to I like what you said about unhelpful. getting people used to a new stat because just walking around the press box the last few years. I'm listening to people have conversations and they're citing statistics that they were not citing three years ago and that they probably don't have a full grasp or understanding of right now. Like I'm listening to people talk about guys spin rate when I know that they don't really understand like what the average spin rate is per pitch in major league baseball. And they see that his number is high on, <laughs> on baseball savant. And so they're dropping this stuff, right? And credit to the folks who in house at the ballpark are putting these statistics up on the scoreboard and putting these analytics on the scoreboard because you're, 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 you're feeding the fan. You're giving them a new diet. Here's a new statistic. Here's a new way to look at what you're seeing down there. And I, I know this is a little bit of a tangent, so I'm sorry about that, but like, w I, I know sometimes when you hear somebody drop a weighted runs created plus or whatever, and it feels like a hard, like, like record scratch where you're like, Ugh, mm. ugh that's, that's like kind of tough on my ear <laughs> weighted runs created plus like in this segment on TV or whatever, but, or, or just like talking to a fan. But what I appreciate about it is that that, that, that suggests that that fan or that analyst is aware of league context and is aware of the need to adjust for where and when you are doing what the damage doing. that you're doing. And that to me is an important headway to have made into the conversation that, that kind of stuff really matters. And that what you're doing, it's not as simple as home and away. Like people know that what you're doing at Coors and what you're doing at Petco are two different things, but like that it, it matters what position you're doing them at or what the overall league offensive environment is at the time. That's important. Even if, I, you know, the use of weighted runs created plus or whatever is still a little bit clunky. Well, I think, I think we the most interesting thing about the wins above replacement discussion is that if you were to get a bunch of baseball executives on the phone and ask them about what the most important statistic is in baseball, uh, I'll, most of them would not even say war because each team has a staff of nerds stuffed in a broom closet somewhere in their baseball operations department. And they each team develops their own formula for wins above replacement based on what they value more. And not every team values the same thing. Not every team looks at baseball the same way in terms of uh, what do we need to do better to win baseball games, given what we're allocated in terms of resources. Uh, how do we how do we find a player that better fits our game and how we think it it it, it the science behind winning baseball games is. So each team will have their own formula for wins above replacement and they'll have their own calculations. And they use that in, in free agency where it's like, you know, we, we look at these free agents and we're like, man, like he's coming off a nine war season last year. Well, the Cardinals might look at that guy and be like, well, we, we've got him at like a six and a half based on like our formula. So it's, it's vastly different. And that's beautiful. Yes. That's the art. That's part like of that. Th that is part of why I want to trying to give me the rosters. Jay, give me all four. Give me all 40 rosters. Give me all 40 fucking spots in September. Why? Because I've had the analytical nerds that have made 
their headway into the data and they have figured out how to grow all of these arms and how to make these guys valuable for us. And so, down the most important stretch of our season, why can't I dip into all of these guys that I'm turning into absolute animals right now? Just beasts. But, it's time to show off my circus. Here they come. What one of the, one of the things that I think makes sports bad is when it becomes homogenized. And so to Jared's point, if there are still s- gaps in internal team evaluations on players and stuff like that, that to me is a great thing because I don't want teams to all view things the same way and I don't want them to value players the same way uh, and I don't want them to construct their teams pitching or offense in exactly the same manner. And we've seen that in baseball and we've certainly seen that in other sports. Um, Parody. And I think it, it's always better when there's a, a, a diversity of approach um, yeah. well, uh, to, to piggyback off that, uh, I don't know, maybe I can find it really quick if I look, but Kike Hernandez on foul territory was talking about how it was a little fishy that, uh, teams like their offers were all kind of the same shockingly or suspiciously was more implicated there that they were more suspiciously in line with each other. It was like the same years. It was the same dollars and we don't want that. I mean, but that's what the information that, that I mean, trust me this day and age and all of the information out right now and accessible was the, the worst nightmare for Scott Boris because it was Scott Boris who was able to paint his player in a very different light than some of the other folks were because he was using information and telling stories a little differently than other folks were because they just didn't have some of the resources. Well, now could you imagine I, the Boris Corp war metric? And he's like, yo, I know it says he's got a three on fan grass, but if you look at the Boris war, <laughs> yeah, this oh. guy's seven wins above replacement. <laughs> you joke, buddy. No, exactly. That's you joke. <laughs> Joe, my friend, I was in the room. <laughs> like it's, that's real. That is absolutely I, real. I, I, to the point about this having been Boris's worst nightmare or agency's worst nightmare. I think there's really something to that oh, though, I know because that is, dude. I remember. I, I think I've ter- I've told the story before, but the, about getting to be in the room with Scott Boris and like he wasn't actually negotiating a contract, but he was kind of like holding court and kind of doing his thing, and at the winter meetings one year, and I remember like. I was, he, he was told that I was kind of like a stat guy or whatever. So he started like, or he and his staff started busting out, you know, kind of these stats as to why Rafael Soriano was, uh-huh. you know, actually the greatest closer Nasty. ever or whatever. And, you know, why he deserved a massive, massive contract coming off that big, big save season. And, um, those, the, the things that were being shared were essentially really good baseball reference searches. And the idea that like, I mean, that's just like obviously not cutting it in 2024 or 2023. So like, I'm sure the business evolved, but the, the fact that like, that's not a move that you can go to because there are, there's so much more information available from the team side too. Now that like, even if you go directly to the owner, he's just not getting snowed by information of that quality anymore. So it's absolutely changed, uh, from, from their end. I have the cut right here computer models that are used by many teams so they'll pump out a number and that's why a lot of times free agents are like yo i got the same exact number from three teams yeah i'm not i'm not gonna say the c word but i think the c word needs to be with a capital c you know um the timing of the calls were very similar uh the numbers were pretty much the same throughout um i think uh the dodgers were were the highest ones because I mean they they uh, one way that they that they talked to me through the free agency process was we have these compete like these <clears throat> programs that can project what this guy is going to do next year but the problem with these programs is that they don't take injuries or things like this into consideration so they just think that I was healthy and that's what I can do what I've been doing what I did last year and. Um, Obviously, not just offensively, but my defensive numbers went down, which is something that's always been there. And, um, you know, the, the back comes and goes because it's 
it's baseball. It's hitting is the hardest thing to do. But I mean, for me, I've never struggled defensively. And I basically, I felt like I struggled defensively all year long. And um, those are the things that the computer can't tell you that are going on. And they were like, you know, we value him so highly because he was able to, you know, do what he did last year, going through, through his struggles. And we, we've, we, we know what he can do when he's healthy and, and, and we're going to bet on the player. And, um, but like I said, calls were kind of around the same time. Silence period was kind of around the same time all the time. Um, numbers were pretty much the same. Um, I don't know these, these, I think these, the teams that use these, these, uh, computer programs to project salaries and project numbers, they're all using the same one. And I think they all have the same password. So, uh, <laughs> that's kind of how free agency has been going. And it's not just me, man. Like a lot of guys that were out there in free agency and are still out there are saying the same thing. So, um, one of the, I heard a lot this off season was we're gonna, we're gonna make this offer and. Uh, if you don't take it within the next two days, we're going to offer it to somebody else. And if they take it, it's off the table for you. Um, that's something that was used a lot this off season as well. Um, not just for me, but like other players too. Uh, so, you know, it was just, it was very interesting, but, uh, one thing I'm, I'm, I'm sure of, and it's that I'm glad it's over. That was Kike Hernandez on foul territory. Uh, yeah, very interesting. I feel like that that uh, those comments didn't make the rounds the way that I kind of expected them to. Like just hearing him talk when it came out the day that it came out, I was like, "Huh, uh, very interesting." The not so much the part about like you know teams are gonna uh, offer similar years. They're gonna offer. They're gonna have their equations that say like, "All right, this guy's worth seven million, and everyone's kind of in a one million dollar range." I thought what was most interesting was the timing like everyone's getting their offers around the same time like why why would teams be synced up like that well like, here's the thing uh, is it it's not necessarily about the teams being synced up it's about the agents who's else who, who else is having those conversations jared who else is having yeah, those guess, conversations yeah. yeah and if you are somebody who represents multiple people I, I think everybody understands how you become. And that's why we've talked about certain agents being the puppet master of free agency. Because if you understand the wants and the desires of franchise X and franchise Y, then you can play that against franchise a and franchise B based on your player resources, who you have. Mm -hmm. And that's what he's done. That's what a lot of the agents try to do. So like yeah. in that regard, I feel like that, that question is a, yeah, I, I mean, look, man, you, you start to go down a lot of different rabbit holes with this stuff. Yeah. We don't have to harp on that too much. I know that we just kind of beat the free agency thing into the ground all winter because that was the main storyline is where the fuck are these guys? Why aren't they signing? And, um, but yeah, that just kind of tied into more of the conversation that we were, we were just having, but <clears throat> we can move on. Uh, Shota Imanaga to start his uh, big league career. Ten innings, four hits, zero runs, zero walks, and twelve strikeouts for the six and three Chicago Cubs. Uh, Joseph, I know that you are a huge proponent of Japanese baseball. What have you liked so far from Shota Imanaga? He's been lights out. I mean, I read his book, so yeah, I would you would know he was a good pitcher if you read. He has an entire book about pitching, so I don't know. What's it called again, you. dude? It's in Japanese. I don't fucking know. <laughs> All right, how to pitch? <laughs> like, <laughs> I thought you read it though. I was. I read well, that, it. That that was good. the impressive part. Is it? <laughs> is that Joey read it in Japanese? Apparently, <laughs> <laughs> that was. I got translators, man. I got a whole staff over here. Yeah. From BD headquarters. I got people. He just who, pressed who the book to, to his face and just closed his eyes. <laughs> just yeah. Imprinted on him. Well, it has a lot of good stuff on it. Right? You guys can learn a lot about the uh, art of pitching. Got it. But the one thing that is interesting with Imanaga, I don't know how much he got paid. What uh, if everyone remembers? What was it like? I could look 50? it up real quick. Two years, 22 million. 
Rock. And that's it. Two, yeah, two years, $22 million. Let me look at that again because the reactions, I did not like that reaction from Jay Hay. I could be wrong. <laughs> is that a, I, don't I thought it was 50. It, is there, I'm just on, there's team options, but I believe, yeah, two years, 22 million, according to baseball reference. But there you're right, that four, sounds. That was, it was a four year deal. Okay, never mind. Four years, fifty-three million. Yeah, the reason why it says that because yeah. they got club options. Four years, fifty-three, 53 million. million. But yeah. that's still, from what this guy's shown so far, I guess it's only two starts. But if you look at the Fangraphs projections, I never was able to say this before, but like they had him and Yamamoto projected at the same war, like exactly the same. And Yamamoto, we know how you got the most paid player of all fucking time. You'd think, and then a projections projecting a guy who played in Japan. I guess it's kind of hard to do that. Mm. But I mean, he's right now looking like the highest value player of all time because he's always done his lights out and they're kind of predicted this on fan graphs at least. Do you know what his nickname is, Joe? Um, what the fuck was his nickname? <clears throat> uh, I, f- uh, I forget, but it's good. The Throwing Philosopher. Yes, I was the one who told you that actually. So thank you for reminding me that I had told you that. Um, that's why I could, because he wrote a book about pitching. I mean, how old that, is this that guy? You've read 30. Yeah, you already read got a book. Published <laughs> author, a philosopher. Damn. And he's lights out. Yes. Uh Jay Hey, do you have uh do you have any takeaways from Shota Imanaga so far? Yeah. Second highest whiff rate among Splits. left-handed starters overall this season. Um, and batters are one for 24, uh, which is an 042 batting average off of his fastball. And mm-hmm. I like, again, it's early, uh, and I'd be more curious about Dallas's opinion having watched the fastball. But like the big deal with him, supposedly, and maybe one of the reasons why he got the modest contract that Joey was talking about was because his fastball was supposed to be pretty homer prone and we'll see how it works in the summer at Wrigley field. Um, but right now, like nobody's really touching it. So it's tough to hit home runs, but having watched both of his starts or his start and a half, um, it visually, it looks really, the whole thing looks like really pretty goddamn viable to me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Jay, he never had an ERA above a three in Japan, except for one year. Yeah, and, and with the fastball specifically, the command, superb right now. 76% strike rate with the fastball. Off that is the split, and he's throwing that at a 68% strike clip as well. Uh, 60% miss rate on the split. It, it, it's, he's, it's the vert game, right? Fastball's holding, split off that. Yeah, it's, it's, it can be real. It can be very real. Because the fastball is what, 90, I think, 94, right? 94, 95, maybe 94. But, yeah. There's it's no- averaging 92-4 this season. Yeah. So, I mean, he's topping out at 94, I would say. Um, he's, he's attacking guys. And I think it's because he's confident in his ability to move the fastball. And he's confident in his ability to throw the split off of it. You know, it's not like the other pitchers were getting a ton of run, the you know slider. Um, it's that fastball split combination that's just going to uh, is going to be wiping folks out. Dallas, do you think, or how much of this is sustainable? How much of this is uh, the league's not familiar with him, so they don't know what to do with him yet, but they soon will. Like, where where do you fall on all that? Um, th- they they will, and that's you know. The reason that we talked about spider tack and what it was doing to hitters is they have the database in their head, right? And when they see certain pitches, they can sort of go back to this database and say, oh, it looks like this. I've seen this before. It looks like this. And that was the problem with the tack because everything just looked like the shit we had never seen before. So I say all that to say that once guys start to feel him and get a feel for him and what his stuff plays like and how it looks coming out they'll they'll be that much closer to being able to make adjustments um but i just think that that combination of the fastball that rides and the split off of that if you have command of that uh, like it's just a it's a game that we haven't seen a ton of 
consistently the way that that game is played in Japan or overseas, right? It's, it's split heavy. And we're just starting to kind of circle back around to that. So I think the scouting reports will be out soon, sooner rather than later. And guys are just going to have to get to the fastball because you don't want to get to that split. And I think that's going to be the conversation is maybe you go early on this guy because you don't want to get to that secondary stuff because it doesn't look like that's any fun. All right. Um, we're going we're gonna to wrap this up with Paul Skeens in a Steven Strasburg tribute as Dallas's internet in Texas is getting progressively worse. We can still hear you. You just sound like a robot and we're kind of like have to like mentally like fill in the words in between. But how long have we gone, Jake? Well, how long is this podcast? Uh, we're at an hour 20. Right oh, now. this is already fucking beautiful. This is a sweet spot. All right. We're going to finish it off, Dallas, for you. Uh, Paul Skeens uh-huh. in his second AAA start. Three in uh, he's gone three innings both times. This is uh his second start. Three innings, one hit, zero runs, one walk, and another six strikeouts as he awaits his call-up before he is to join the eight and two. Pittsburgh Pirates, Dallas. That's right. That's right, Jay Hay. You son of a bitch. You swarch buckle and savage. Sorry, you didn't deserve that. The Buckos, baby. The Buckos. You're right, Jerry. Eight and two, leading the Central. We've already got two walk off wins this year. Already got two walk off wins this year. Three extra inning wins. The Buckos are back, baby. Believe that. The Buckos are back. Four quality starts in a row from the starting staff. Marco Gonzalez stepped right up. Marti Perez stepped right up. Let's go. Let's go. Yeah, and maybe maybe not bludgeoning the baseball. That's okay. We're going to catch these W's any way we can. Cast the net wide, Jay Hay. There's W's out there for everybody in Bucko land. They've been one of the more exciting teams to watch. You got, I mean, like they held their own against the Baltimore Orioles. You're walking off one of the, the team. I think how many people the on this podcast on. had the Baltimore Orioles in the World Series? All of yeah, us? Pretty much. Nope. Not Joey. Not Joe. Who'd you have from the AL, Joe? The Yankees. Come on. Play the crickets. Come on. 30 championships, baby. <laughs> We're going for 30, 27 rings, baby. Nah, that's 20, 28. 28. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, but they're going to lose to the Braves. Did you not even look at my fucking picks? Uh, you would no. have not been surprised. I picked Imanaga, rookie of the year. Oh, there you go. That's a great maybe pick. Maybe he's on to something. And he didn't pick Strider either. So maybe this guy is smart as fuck. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. It could be. Uh, last thing before we get out of here Steven Strasburg. Release a statement officially announcing his retirement. I feel like he's already retired. Like he's been retired, but uh, yeah, but there was a bunch of shit going on. A statement. Yeah, he needed to get broken off. He needed to get uh, his uh, financials in order before he rode off into the sunset down in D.C. Um, but he put out his statement, and I know Jay, hey, you had something prepared about Steven Strasburg today. I just saw a, a well followed account that will remain nameless. Uh, quote tweet the news of Steven Strasburg's retirement and with a you know sort of gotcha thing on the two hundred and forty five million dollar contract and how many innings he threw after that and I I understand that that needs to be a part of the conversation and Strasburg's you know inability to stay fully healthy can be a paragraph in the conversation about Steven Strasburg but it really just I, I don't care about the Nationals really it just really kills me. When a guy delivers a, a performance of a lifetime in a single postseason, and like y- you can cut the stats up however you want, it, it is in some ways one of the most successful results oriented postseason pitching runs we have ever seen. Randy Johnson at one, Bumgarner 14, like all, the, the, all of those, it's right there. And uh, for all the talk that people like to do about, uh, oh, 
you know, sports about putting the team first or leaving it all out on the field. These rich athletes won't do that anymore or whatever, whatever. Steven Strasburg literally did that. Yeah. And then got a contract afterwards and was unable to perform at the level that he previously had because he left it all, uh, not exclusively because, in large part because of what he gave the team in 2019. And so that needs to be part one. This is the 2019 World Series MVP. He had one of the great singular postseason runs ever. He was a multi-time Cy Young contender, had trouble staying on the field, and the Nationals ended up you know, eating a lot of 245 or however it's going to be phrased properly. That, that's just the soapbox thing I wanted to do on Strasburg because he was appointment television at his peak. Um, and in the end, he delivered exactly what you would want a high-end pitcher to deliver, which is uh, signature post uh, performances in a postseason that end in a World Series. Rant over. I'm sorry. St- no, no. Apologize. Not, yeah, don't apologize for that. That's well said, Jay Hay. And he is one of those yeah. dudes that we we want. Yeah, he deserves that shine. And I, I can't remember. There's nobody still to this date. I mean, maybe outside. Like, well, I wasn't even, I don't know, Shohei. Um, but like the debut, like you were geared up, locked in, pumped Huge, man. for that debut. Because you knew you you knew that baseball was gifting us this just this this talent that we that we were going to be so lucky to see unfold, and the fact yeah. that we got to see it on the game's biggest stage. Because how many guys can we say that about too? That we love them; they're great here and then gone, and we never got to see them under the brightest lights. And that we don't have to say that about Steven Strasburg. And but to your point, the only debut that I can think of that comes close to Strasburg uh, in terms of appointment television was Harper. Mm -hmm. And it's different in a way when it's the starting pitcher. Yes. Who's going to be performing for you every half inning as opposed for at least for five or six innings as opposed to Harper. Um, That's why I said Otani. Yeah. Who's because he was like, it was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is one two and it's disappearing. (laughs) And like. I know it's like a personal anecdote, but like I will never forget seeing Strasburg and Matt Harvey deal at City Field as like both were kind of ascending into ace form. And like, you know, we started this podcast or spent the most time on this podcast talking about the fragility of modern pitching. And like, boy, it, there's no better snapshot of that sentiment than, you Those know, guys. Matt Harvey <laughs> and Steven Strasburg being like legit. I'm driving to see these two guys pitch several hours round trip. Um, and now we haven't thought about Harvey in years and Strasburg's only been in the news because his retirement has been litigated by his side and the team. Um, yeah. Otherwise, he would have been retired three years ago. So, um, yeah, I just want I want that to be the lasting memory of Strasburg. And I hope for people outside of national sp- fans specifically, it is. Yeah. Um, Joseph, final thoughts today? Uh, final thoughts. Um, we'll just get, get well soon to Spencer Strider, I guess. I don't know. I don't really have a final thought prepared. It is the eclipse day. Yes. <laughs> yep. So that's expect a lot of moon shots tonight. That's oh. my prediction. Okay. Maybe, maybe Shohei goes deep and I'm maybe I'm thinking, uh, who else? I'm going to get, I think, I think. I think Austin Riley goes deep tonight. Again. Actually, Johan Soler, Solar Power. Okay. That's not his name. Jorge I Soler. <laughs> I was going to go with Joe. Johan Soler. <laughs> Johan Soler. <laughs> <laughs> Johan Soler, be on the lookout. The when Solar the, Power. When do the A's play the Giants, Dallas? Uh, um, right after the All-Star. Okay, yeah. Be on the lookout for a Johan Sorlier reference <laughs> on the A's broadcast. You know what, Joe? I'm uh, going to request an interview with him just so I can... So, Johan Sorlier. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm just a big fucking idiot. Just wait till he gets a bomb tonight, <laughs> and then you guys are going to be sad. Johan Sorlier, uh, Braves legend, going to hit a moonshot. Yeah. Um, I actually have a final thought today. I know I usually ask and I don't usually give. Um, 
but uh, it was brought to my attention. I was watching the Detroit Tigers broadcast over the weekend, and uh, our man Dallas Braden fumbled an easy Two, three, nothing. Whoa. No, no, no. No, no. Another foul ball on one and two and just below the visiting TV booth. Dallas Braden was uh, reaching out over there, and he is heartbroken. Dallas, you good, man? You okay? You right, bud? That's a no. <laughs> Somebody just yelled my name. Like that was a... Like that was our... No, that's over there. Yeah. Dallas hiding. That's going to be a good, like, week long of content for him. On his podcast. Baseball is very alive over there. Uh, <laughs> Dallas, would you like to explain yourself? Because uh, I know you're already trying to deny it here, apparently. But uh, you dropped a gimme back to the booth foul ball. Looks uh, like that is that is not even close to accurate. Mm. Not even close to accurate. That son of a bitch, JB. And uh, yeah, he wore. <laughs> we actually rode home together. Uh, he, he gave me a ride home. Shout out, JB. Appreciate that. Appreciate the lift. Mm. Um, and and kind of gave me shit again too. But uh, yeah, he knew what he was doing. I there was no. Ch- I was not. I was twenty feet away from the ball. Not even close yeah. to me. I'm just trying to make a play. I'm 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 agile. I'm on my. This is the year. This is the year that I get my foul ball in the booth. This is the year. So no, I was not. I was not even close. I was. I'm a fucking athlete. Are you kidding me? I'm the best athlete. The minute I show up to that fucking ballpark, there's no, there's no better athlete there. Once I'm there, best athletes there. Mm. So I'm just trying to. Yeah, it's because you call that uh, athletics. So that's easy. <laughs> the worst team ever created. So what do you, what do you call that, Joe? A double what? Um, uh, entendrum. <laughs> entendrum. Entendrum. <laughs> <laughs> the fucking gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> The uh, double entendre. Uh, well, hey, uh, before we do get out of here, I got two things. One quick shout out to Zach Geloff, who damn near hit for the cycle yesterday. Uh, it was a very exciting day. Big hit parade for the athletics. That was yeah. really nice to see. Um, but mm. but Jake, Jake, we got the eclipse. A, a massive eclipse, Jake. A massive eclipse. Are you ready <laughs> for this? <laughs> Jake's ready. Kidding me, Dallas. Been Been waiting for this. For 193 years. <laughs> the biggest day for the moon that I've been alive for. <laughs> you and me both, brother. You and me both. Don't stare directly into it because they say that can cause harm. We'll find out. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. today is a once in a lifetime event. So get out there, protect your retinas. All right. Jake, do you know what kind of uh you know what kind of moon we're working with this afternoon? I mean, it's got to be full. I think in uh, in Boston, we got 93% uh, totality coverage, Ooh. probably 100% out where you are, but yeah. we'll take what we can get up here. Yeah, yeah we're getting, uh, we got 100% coverage out here at the uh, Las Colinas Resort, and I'm going to go get weird and probably lay out in the middle of a fairway somewhere you to watch this thing. I can't wait. Mm. I'm gonna be uh, I'm gonna be looking at the eclipse with Big Poppy, um, on top of the Prudential building. Nice, the Pru. <laughs> yeah, so. that'll be great. That's my that's my afternoon. Um, all right. Uh, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe on YouTube. We're trying to get those numbers, but we're pretty close. Like already, like in like a couple of weeks, we're already pretty close to like getting back to what we were at before. Uh, but subscribe on YouTube. And we will catch you right back here for more Baseball is Dead on Wednesday. Wow!